In this problem, we're going to be practicing using the ideal gas equation. So, what we have here is a tank, another rigid tank, holding two kilograms of helium. Now, helium has a molecular weight. So this is a molecular weight of four kilograms per kilomole. The pressure inside the tank is 300 kilopascals. And the temperature inside the tank is 27 degrees Celsius. What this problem is asking is what is the volume of this tank? Well, if you remember, for an ideal gas, and keep that in mind too, okay? So we can't use the ideal gas equation for a liquid. And we'll be doing a problem later, probably in the next video, looking at how well it the ideal gas equation predicts um, the pressure or the volumes for, for um, saturated mixtures. So the ideal gas equation, like we described before, is the pressure times the volume is equal to mass times the ideal gas constant times temperature. It's something we need to note about the ideal gas equation is that all units should be in absolute values. So let me write that here. The reason I point that out is because a lot of times in class students will not take the units of these into account and they'll use, for example, instead of using Kelvin, Instead, in the equation, they'll use degrees Celsius. And it's important to make the distinction uh, that we use ab these absolute value of the units. So let me go ahead and uh, plug in these values. So pressure, remember, we're going to use 300 kilopascals, 300,000 pascals times volume is equal to the mass, two kilograms, times the ideal gas constant. I'm going to just leave it as R, and we'll solve that separately, times temperature. So again, we're going to, we need to use absolute units, so we're going to do 27 plus 273. Now I left this kind of blank here for the I calculation of the um, ideal gas constant because what we're going to do is we're going to calculate the ideal gas constant and the ideal gas constant really depends on the gas that we're using okay so if we are talking about air the ideal gas constant for air is going to be different for helium the ideal gas constant for nitrogen is going to be a little bit different than it is for air so when we talk about different types of gases, each gas has its own corresponding ideal gas constant. So here, the ideal gas constant is the universal gas constant divided by the molecular weight. Now the universal gas constant is always the same. So this one changes depending on the gas. So this depends on gas. This one here, the universal gas constant is always the same. So the universal gas constant is 8314 joules per kilomole degree Kelvin. That's always the same, regardless of the gas. doesn't change. The molecular weight for helium, we already said was four kilograms per kilomole. Okay. Now in this equation, our kilomoles cancel, and we're left with our R value, which we can plug into here. 
So our R value is going to be 8314 divided by 4. In this equation, we can solve for the volume. And what you guys will find out is that the volume in this tank is 4.154 meters cubed. So that's one application that we've used for the using the ideal gas equation. Okay. Let's do another problem using the ideal gas equation. So you guys see it's somewhat simple to use this equation. What's important is one, make sure you have the right ideal gas constant. Two, make sure that you uh, use absolute units. And three, make sure, and maybe this should be the first step, is that you, uh, in fact, have a gas that you're dealing with. So the next problem, I'm gonna talk about tires. So we have a tire, and that tire has a certain pressure. You guys are all familiar with tires and tire pressure, I'm sure. So initially, this tire is at 25 degrees Celsius. If we stick a little gauge on the tire, the gauge pressure would read 210 kilopascals. And the volume of the tire, we know beforehand, and that's 0 0.025 meters cubed. Now, we're also going to take into account the atmospheric pressure. That's 100 kilopascals. All right. Now, remember, we're talking about gauge pressure here. All right. Gauge pressure. Gauge pressure is not the same as atmospheric pressure. That's why I included it here. And we need to have a discussion about that again on top of what we talked about before. In state two, so let's talk about state two. The temperature rises. So state two, we have 50 degrees Celsius temperature. And we're going to assume here that the tire doesn't change shape. So the tire just kind of has a rigid shape. The volume at two is the same as the volume at one. And what we're interested in is finding the gauge pressure. What is the gauge pressure inside the tire at state two? Okay. So let's find out how we do that. Well, since we're dealing with the gas, we can use the ideal gas law. PV equals MRT. Now we know uh, pressure at state one. We know volume at state one and two. We know that the R is the same gas. Remember, R depends on gas, and it stays the same. So we can assume that uh, the R is equal in both cases. And we know the temperature in both cases. What else do we know? Well, we know it's a closed system. And when we say closed system, we know that mass at 1 equals mass at 0.2. All right? If we solve for mass in our ideal gas equation, mass is equal to PV over RT. So knowing that mass 1 equals mass 2, we can plug this in as P1 V1 over RT1. And that's equal to P2, V2, over R, T2. So R, the R values cancel out because they are the same. It's the same gas. The volume, we assume, is the same. So we can assume those cancel also. So if we solve for pressure at 2, pressure at 2 is going to be equal to P1 times T2 over T1. Now this is important. Remember, we always want to use our absolute units. Okay? So pressure at 1 is going to be an absolute value, an absolute case. So let's go ahead and prescribe an absolute value to it. So this is going to be 210,000. And remember, just as a side note, let me, uh, let me emphasize this as a side note.
remember that pressure absolute is equal to atmospheric pressure plus gauge pressure. So absolute pressure here in our ideal gas equation is going to be the atmospheric pressure, which we said was 100 kilopascals, plus the gauge pressure, 210 kilopascals. Now let me write this over here. So this is 210,000 plus 100,000. This is times T2, which is 50, plus 273. Remember, I'm using absolute units, converting it to degrees or to Kelvin. And T1 is 25 plus 273. Okay. So solving for P2, we would get. 336,000 or I'm going to write this as 336 kilopascals. And remember this is absolute. So if we want to know what the gauge pressure is we would subtract the atmospheric pressure and we would have a value of, and this is gauge pressure, a value of 236 kilopascals. What's the pressure difference between the two cases for this temperature rise? Well initially we have 210 kilopascals and finally we have 236. This is 26 kilopascal. So here are the answers for both engage and absolute pressure. I'll circle this one too. Okay, so those problems are simple enough. Let's go ahead and just do one more. Let me turn the page here. All right, one more problem. So let's say we have a rigid tank again. In this tank, we have two kilograms of refrigerant 134A. The pressure is 800 kilopascals and the temperature is 120 degrees Celsius. The question is to find the volume of the vessel. All right, so let's determine the volume of this vessel. And we also want to find the internal energy. Okay, so let's look at, and remember, now we're going to have to think about, we're changing gears a little bit. So this is, uh, we don't know, so we don't know if we can use the ideal gas equation. We don't know um, if it's in a saturation state, if it's liquid. Uh, we don't know what it is right now. So this is a, we just can't use it unless we're sure. Before we knew it was air, before we knew what the fluid was. So now we have refrigerant 134A. We know that the temperature is 120 degrees Celsius and pressure is 800 kilopascals. Okay. So let's go here. Let's go to our tables again, bringing up table A11. And let's go ahead and look at at 100 and so this is for saturated refrigerant, yeah. So let's go ahead and look at 120 degrees uh, Celsius. What is our saturation pressure. So you guys see here on the chart for refrigerant that even if we had 3.9 or 4 megapascals of pressure and the temperature was 100 degrees Celsius, we would have a superheated vapor. So if it was above 100 degrees Celsius, even with a very high pressure, we would have still a superheated vapor. 
okay? So, and maybe I can illustrate this a little bit for you guys too. So let's see. So here we have the T, our TV diagram. All right. So let's say that uh, our current pressure is uh, 800 kilopascals. All right. And our temperature is 120 degrees Celsius. Well, at 800 kilopascals, we can look at that. Let's see. What's the temperature? Well, we know it's going to be about between 30 and 32 degrees Celsius would be the temperature that would correspond to this saturated state. Okay? So, at a pressure of 800 kilopascals, we'd expect the saturated state to be about... 31 degrees Celsius. That's when we'd be on this line here. Well, what's our actual temperature? Our actual temperature is 120 degrees Celsius. So we're way over here, okay? We're way in the superheated vapor region. So that's one way that we can check to use that, make sure that we're using the right tables. All right, so we're, sorry, we're way over here on the uh, superheated vapor section. Okay? So we know now we need to use the this, this superheated vapor tables. Let's go ahead and use them. So for a uh, pressure of 800 kilopascals, which is 0.8 megapascals, all right? we have a temperature of 120 so our specific volume at this condition is 0 0.037625 meters cubed per kilogram okay and you guys can see that here I've highlighted it there on the table so here's our specific volume if we know the mass in this chamber we can say that the volume is equal to the specific volume times mass. Our specific volume is here. I won't write it again. And that's times two kilograms. So our volume in this of this chamber is 0 0.07525 meters cubed. Okay. Let's also find the total internal energy of this system. So the total internal energy, we can find the specific value, which is per unit mass for the same condition. Let's see what column this corresponds to. It's the second column here. At 120 degrees Celsius, at 800 kilopascals, it's 327.87 kilojoules per kilogram. Well, to get the total internal energy, we would have to multiply our specific internal energy times the mass, and our total internal energy here would be 655.7 kilojoules. So that is how we would solve that problem. And I need to move this out of the way so you guys can see. Um, so there are your answers for this problem. I hope you can review them. This lecture went a little bit long, but uh, I plan to do one more problem set for Chapter 4, and then we'll start talking about some other things uh, from Chapter 5.